welcome back everyone to another Psych Reacts video. Today we are back again with Ronald Stanford, the boy who was 13 years old when he committed a double homicide. Today we are going to be looking further into more of an interview of him and the crime and seeing what he is doing today. Now the last interview I want to point out that it kind of seemed like the whole interview, the whole angle, was positioned to make the audience feel sorry for Ronald Sanford. Since he was only 13, years old when he committed this crime, he had received a 170 year sentence, while the partner to this crime has only received five years. Now that is highly unfair, especially to give that much of a sentence to the younger person in the whole situation. Someone had to take the fall for the lives of two elderly women. I just want to preface this with, to make this fair, it would have been better to either both have them receive the 170 year sentence or, or take them into rehabilitation since they were so young. But let's go ahead and jump into this interview and learn a little bit more about Ronald Sanford's past. Ronald Sanford is running, but he's not going anywhere. Free time isn't free behind barbed wire. In Michigan City's maximum security Indiana State Prison. Can you lock up yourself? Yes, ma'am. In a six by nine foot cell. You lock your door, you don't have to worry about taking nobody taking your stuff. Ronald Sanford has grown from a boy of 15 to a man of 40. That's my state. No man's your enemy, no man's your friend, every man's your teacher. He's had 25 years to consider how a single choice became his singular destiny. How a boy of 13 went from mowing lawns to committing murder. Police say Sanford tortured, beat, and then brutally stabbed 83-year-old Anna Harris and 87-year-old Julia Belmar countless times. I tried to put myself in the position of the victims and how would I feel? You know, what would be the result and effect of that? Something terrible, you know, somebody murdered my grandmothers or my mother and just, how do you ever get over that? And how did it happen? How does a boy of 13 become a murderer? So how does a boy of 13 become a murderer? Now a lot of this will be a result of the childhood. What did their home life look like? What did their supervision look like? What did their upbringing look like? A lot of those things factor in to how a person turns out. So if you have a good home life, you have supporting parents, you have parents who are authoritative but aren't overly authoritative, you know, to the point where they are like dictators, <laughs> you know? If you have parents who are going to set rules for you to follow and make punishments if you don't, then you will learn the correct behavior for those situations, right? If you were told to be home by 10 o'clock at night, right? Right? and say you show up at 12. If you are punished as a result of not showing up on time, then you are less likely to not abide by the rules. It all ties into those parenting styles, right? In the parenting styles, you have authoritative, you have authoritarian, you have permissive, and you have neglectful. Now, neglectful is just uninvolved, doesn't supervise you at all. Permissive is allows you to get away with a bit more things. They allow you to do things, but they're not necessarily uninvolved. So your authoritarian parenting style is the most strict and not as warm towards the children. Your authoritarian is said to be the perfect parenting style because it provides both that support and the strict rules. So let's go ahead and jump into Ronald Sanford's background, childhood, and let's see what his childhood looked like. We captured Sanford's downward spiral as he sat in the back of a police car for cutting school. How come you left school today? We never went to school. At Shortridge Middle School, he was paddled and reprimanded. This happens again. You borderline. I'm keeping you here. A kid from a turbulent home my mom was an alcoholic on welfare, you know, she had many suitors, you know, she was physically abusive. Sanford started with petty crime at the age of 10. I didn't have any uh, <laughs> fatherly influence, and I think had I had that, I wouldn't be in prison. In August of 1987, three months after the day he cut school. School was out. It was summer break, and my mom had left town, so I was home by myself. 
unsupervised the day he and 15-year-old Sean Rowe went door to door offering to mow lawns to earn money. All right, so he mentions that his mom was an alcoholic and he did not have a father in the picture. The day he and his friend went and committed this crime, his mom was out of town. A 13-year-old boy was left home alone for God knows how long. So she was completely irresponsible for her own child. He most likely received little to no attention from his mom and and then of course he got none from his absentee father. So this type of household puts the child in this position of being unloved and that causes them to act out, causes them to get in trouble. Maybe they go around, do like petty stealing or you know they skip school a lot and they get in trouble at school a lot. So a lot of that parenting shapes the child into this rebellious kid. Now if on the other spectrum, if you were authoritarian, which means you were very strict and you had little support for the children, that could also push them to be the same rebellious type. So both neglectful and authoritative parenting styles have the chance to form this type of child, to build this type of character. At the age of 13, you're most likely in eighth grade, possibly in freshman year or going into freshman year of high school. And at that age, you still probably shouldn't be left home alone for like over a day right? Since the mother left him unattended, these two boys went and had this idea that their neighbors had money, let's go take it from them. Went door to door offering to mow lawns to earn money. I was somehow convinced that the ladies next door had some money and we could go over there and hey let's go take their money. Forget cutting the grass and it turned into a murder. An ugly thing, an ugly thing to happen. I want to know how it turned into a murder, right? Like I said, I can only we can only speculate what happened and caused it to go in such a horrid direction. My guess would be that the older ladies refused to give their money, so then the boys felt like they had to force it from them. Now, earlier in this video, they mentioned that the police said that they tortured and stabbed the women multiple times. Now, based on that evidence, that is not just a robbery gone wrong. Where does that anger come from? Why did it get so gruesome? I'm so very curious, how does it go from a robbery to a torturing, multiple stabbing, double homicide? There had to have been an alternative motive. Now everybody makes mistakes, right? Some even make mistakes that are to this magnitude. But he received 50 years for each murder, right? And then he received more for the burglary and the rest of his crimes he was charged with. If this were a singular murder, he would have only received 50 years and then whatever the other charges were. Now I did see that he got 20 years for like the burglary crime. So 50 plus 20 is 70. So most likely he would have still spent the rest of his life in prison. However, he would have been more likely to be offered parole but since he made the mistake twice I think that's why they tried him as an adult instead of a juvenile who's messed up. Now later on in this video it flips into the section of him helping younger boys who also have received like juvenile penalties. They've been in juvie for a little bit. You know they've served some sort of sentence in juvie and is trying to help rehabilitate them to not end up like him. So that goes on later in the video but the last thing I want to cover in this interview is how it affected his mom. An ugly thing, an ugly thing to happen. That's Sanford in the blue jacket beside his mother, watching as police removed the bodies of the elderly sisters. 170 years is about the stiffest prison term Ronald Sanford could get. That's my kid, and I don't think it's right. Rehabilitate him. Don't let him sit up in there and lock up. Sanford said he was terrified walking into the Michigan City Prison at age 15. He has lived on every cell block but death row. No matter how tough you are or how smart you are, there's people tougher and smarter in prison. In prison, Ron Sanford found father figures for the first time in some older inmates who protected him and steered him toward college where he actually learned skilled trades. And part of his story too is what happened outside of prison. Outside, it, him going to prison was enough to straighten his mother up. His mother got help, she's now clean and sober, married, she returned to school to pursue a nursing degree, and she visits him regularly, but she did decline my request 
to be interviewed for this story. So it took him going to prison for a double homicide for his mother to straighten up, go get help for her alcoholism, and pursue a career. He also helps children in the juvie system and tries to preach to them, telling them, listen, you need to get your act together because you don't want to end up like me. Although he will be stuck in prison for the rest of his life, he is still able to do things and impact others save others from his sentence, right? Now, I'm not saying in any way, shape, or form that he is a hero. He is not. He killed two people at the age of 13, but at least he is able to hopefully help other children like him and make them see this is the path you're heading towards. You need to change it right now. So, like I mentioned before, I think the first interview we looked at was designed to make Ronald looked like a victim. I think it was designed to make you feel bad and sorry for him because he does have this whole like change.org thing to get him out of prison. But at the end of the day, someone has to pay the price for the death of two people. I don't think it's fair that the older boy got the lesser sentence. I also don't think it's fair that Ronald didn't get to receive any sort of rehabilitation. I think it would have been better to put them through that whole process. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that they wouldn't have made another mistake later on, right? We will never know if he was let out on the streets again, would he end up back in the same position? And the only way to know that would be to let him back on the streets, and that is a risk for society. So it's a tough situation to be in for the courts because either they let this man out and he commits another murder, or they keep him in there and they get a whole bunch of angry people saying, let him out, right? What is gonna be better for society? So I see where they're coming from. However, since he was 13, I do think they should have given him a psychologist or a psychiatrist, have him analyzed, maybe put on some medication, and then see how he performs through that. But someone has to pay the price for the deaths of two people. So once again, leave me your thoughts down in the comments of what you think about this whole situation. We learned a little bit more about Ronald Sanford's childhood and his home life which puts some perspective on to how does a 13 year old boy commit such a horrific act. But if you did watch and enjoy this video, you want to see more Psych Reacts videos like this one, be sure to drop a like down below. Let me know your thoughts once again down in the comments. I love hearing what you guys have to say. But that's gonna do it for this video, so thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Peace!